I can just imagine being there that final week, where as over half a million people came into this town, there really is only 60, 80,000 people that live there. And as they packed in this place, and as Jesus shows up on what we know as Palm Sunday, and he's out in Bethany, and the people here, he's in town, and they're like, this is the time, this is the moment for Messiah to come through the East Gate. I mean, that's the prophecy. And so they kind of all think it's him. And so they run to get him and trying to find out when's he gonna get here? When's he gonna get here? And so if you remember the stories is with his disciples and he's up in Bethany and he finds a, a donkey. That's what kings ride. And as he gets on the foal of a donkey and as he comes down the hill, the people come out just by the thousands and palm branches down, Hosanna, 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 the king is here. And as he goes down the hill, he marches in, this is our king. But as you know, it doesn't take very long for him to start teaching in the temple and he's not the king that they're expecting. He's not the king that's gonna save them from Roman rule. He's got a whole new kingdom coming. And so then he has to get ready for the Passover. And so he sends the guys down to find someone and they end up on this upper side of town in an upper room and they start to have the Passover. And you can just imagine the tension. There's this beautiful moment. He, he waits on them, he serves them, they take communion, but there's this, trial that's coming and they know he's headed to the cross and who's going to deny him and, and who's going to stand and how's this going to go down? And then they walk from the upper room all the way down the hill and they go as on a little journey on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's in that moment, John chapter 14, where he just starts reminding them, telling them, he says, hey, listen to me, John 14, listen to me. If you love me, and they're like, yeah, we love you. If you're, then you're going to obey me. And if you obey me, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask the Father to send you another counselor. They know because they speak Greek, heteros. Heteros is, is one of the same kind. So John 15, he says, if you abide in me, listen to me guys, and I in you, you'll bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. They're like, okay. And so he gets to John 16, he's like, guys, listen to me. I, this is good and he, he knows what's coming. He says, but it's, it's better for you that I leave. Come on, Jesus, you're crazy. It's not better. And he says, no, it's better. I promise it's better for you if I leave because if I leave, the Father's gonna send the counselor and he's gonna be with you forever. So in that moment, you can just imagine their wheels spinning going, okay, what were they expecting? But see, then we know there's the garden, there's the prayer, there's the betrayal. There's the arrest. He's gonna come up to this side of town for trial after trial, six total. They have an opportunity now to release Barabbas or Jesus, and they all say, crucify him. Early morning. I mean, early morning. As a matter of fact, we think they kind of were maybe even a paid off mob that didn't represent the people. They had a rush. Jesus had a rush, pretty unfair trial through the night. But there that morning, as people woke up in a sleepy town, they came out to find this Messiah that they had just welcomed in on, with palm branches on a cross. And as we know, there's a cross and then there's a grave and then there's three days of just silence in this city, wondering what just happened but then we know the rest of the story, right? We know the three ladies right over here ran to the tomb and, and it was empty and they ran into a gardener and that gardener said, go tell everybody the good news. They run back and they get the fellas and the fellas run to the tomb and the fellas come back and everybody's excited. And then for the next 40 days, Jesus is gonna in and out of this city and all the way up to the galley, he's just gonna be appearing to people, talking to them. And so that brings us to Acts chapter one, and I love this. It says, you know, in verse four, it says on one occasion, on one of those times during the 40 days he's unpacking, it says, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. And he just said this, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait, wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you're gonna be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse eight says, listen to me, listen to me. You will receive power 
when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you're gonna be my witnesses. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It's power to move. You're gonna be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so then we know he marches back up to the Mount of Olives and right at the top, somewhere up there, there's a couple towers to commemorate it. He ascends into heaven. And if you remember, the angels are standing at the top saying, Minna Galilee, why are you looking? He's gone, get after it, go, it's time. So they're like, okay, okay, so, so let's wait. But in their minds, but what are we waiting on? I don't know, just wait. I don't know, just wait. And so you're wondering, how long are we gonna wait? I, you know, he, he didn't really say. And so I love this in that moment. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be like tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. It says, verse five, now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not these men who are speaking Galileans? See, all, how in the world, the people, the Levites on the temple, they could speak different languages, but not the fishermen. Because then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, and a whole long list of people, Cretans, Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God on our tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine because having too much wine has always made you speak in other languages, right? <laughs> but you can just picture this moment. And some people, because of the, the word house, they think they're in some house back here. But if you're a Jew, you know the house is the temple, Solomon's portico, the house of God. Jesus, when he was a little boy said, wouldn't I be in my father's house? And so likely the place of this, they're all gathering, maybe expecting, maybe this is the day. And they gather on Solomon's steps, the southern steps, and there's a perfect place to gather. You're not quite in the temple, but you're right outside and it's perfect for about 3,000 people. And as we find the story, the Spirit just shows up. Peter stands up. And as the tongues of fire are resting, and literally at the beginning of the story, they're just praising God. And when they're just talking about how incredible it is, that's what happens when the Spirit comes. You just can't get over how incredible and amazing, how powerful he is. And everybody hears what's going on in their own tongue. And they're going, what's going on? And Peter says, he stands up and I can almost picture him on the platform there on the Southern steps and says, I'll tell you what's going on. And he just gives the first gospel message that gift they had all been waiting for. It's here. The church is born. It's the dawn. And so I just love the way if you track this story within two and a half years, by the power of the Spirit, this new community, this church, says that they're gonna fill Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, within four and a half years, we're gonna start hearing stories around the world of just disciples of disciples filled by the Spirit and power doing amazing, incredible things. It says within 18 years, they're bearing fruit all over the world. Within 28 years, this tiny little group, 3,000 that were baptized that day and all the mikvahs all around the table have turned the world upside down and that gift that he promised still stands today. And I just read through here and I see things like the way when you get into the book of Acts over 55 times, it's gonna, it's gonna refer to the Holy Spirit as he's just, it's just like he's just one of, one of the people in the group, like he's leading, he's prompting, he's opening doors. They're saying things like it seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit. You know, John walks through and he starts off, Jesus calls them seekers, and then he calls them followers. But then in the, right in the end, he says, now I call you friends. And here's what I know, what God, what God wants to do through you, it's what he's doing in you. So maybe, just maybe the dawn of the church here can maybe kind of help you see that there could be a dawn for you as well. 
And all we have to do is tap in to just recognize, to receive not only Jesus and the gospel, but the gift of the Holy Spirit to allow him to be our best friend, to wake up in the morning and say, Spirit, what do you want to do in my life? Like, I want to dig in your word. I want to obey you today, but I want you to fuel me. I want you to guide me. I want you to do the impossible through me. It's always been about taking the gospel message to other people so that everybody else can know the freedom that they have in Jesus. What does God want to do through you because I promise you, you tap into him, you allow the spirit in and there will be a new dawn in your life.